You are listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Films. For more, visit our website at www.megiddofilms.org. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 9th of May, 2015. Thank you all for tuning in. On this week's show, we're going to change from what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, which... I don't know when you when you study a topic for quite a long time and I remember I've had those books on the blood moons for quite a while before I actually delved into them. Anybody who's not aware of what I'm talking about, I, I dealt with the blood moons for the past ooh, four or five radio shows from a get a radio. So I think I've done as much on those issues as it can be possibly done for now and I'm going to change topic, and I remember going through just what I was going to cover for this week. I remember I was I was in a few minds. I had a bunch of things written down, and uh, I I have a very long day now. I don't know if anybody's, if many of you are aware, ever since we've moved to Dundalk, we're no longer in Dublin anymore, myself and my family, and now I have a much longer day. I get a typically about half five in the morning and I'm could be on the train for work at about half six. I travel about oh, I don't know, nearly two hours in the morning, an hour and fifty minutes, something like that, to get to work. So there's a brilliant side of that which is and I get to read a lot and uh, I'm getting to read a lot recently and I'm going through a lot of material which is very, very good. On the on the other side of it is I'm incredibly tired when I get home, so I don't know if that work situation will continue forever. I love where I work as an English teacher, and uh, please pray for me in that uh, wisdom about that, what what to do with it. I'll definitely be doing it for the foreseeable future, uh, because I'm a father and I need to put, and I'm a husband, so I need to put food on the table. So that will be the case for the foreseeable future. But anyway, but. It's harder. Well, I have a lot of material ready to kind of go. It's um, Saturday's kind of been the only day that's really left to me. I mean, Monday to Friday is kind of almost gone now. And when I get home, I might be, I might sometimes I might be asleep by seven o'clock at night if I'm not able to get a, a nap or whatever. So keep me in your prayers if you would. That'd be great. And uh, so anyway, but I've been looking at different topics. Brother and Lord sent on over period of time about doing a show in Calvary Chapel and the Calvary Chapel movement. Now, I remember when he when I first I've known about Calvary Chapel since I was first saved. I attended briefly enough a Calvary Chapel where I'm from in Cork for a couple of months on a Wednesday night it was never I was never a member of the church. And I was also attending a a Baptist Union church in another part of the city. And to be honest, I was incredibly happy in either church. But I thought in my head, well, this is probably as good as it gets. Now, to be fair, I did enjoy the preaching of one uh, person that was in Baptist Union church that was, I remember... I heard a sermon that really impacted me when I went there first. Uh, it was on Genesis chapter 3, and I, I I took it away with me, and it was a great blessing to me. The other thing is, after that, it, it kind of became what I would criticize modern-day evangelicalism for, a lot of, and dispensationalism for, almost treating the Old Testament purely as a kind of a history book. There was no... Pr- exhortation to repent from sin and um and then i remember a, Chris, a christmas program where i was at i'd stopped attending this particular church for a few months and there was i, I knew for a fact the majority of the people that were the first time probably unsaved nearly all of them uh, a load of them and the only gospel message or anything approaching a gospel message that i heard was Come to Christ. No explanation about their need for sin, or, the, or that they're that they were depraved, that they were dead in trespasses and sins, as Ephesians chapter two verse one talks about. 
just come to Christ. Anybody, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, all those will say, well, we came to Christ. You know, they'll all have different opinions, of course, and they will use the opinions of men who exactly is Christ and what does it mean to come to Christ in repentance and faith. But repentance was never brought up. Faith is never brought up. What these things are, it was just a shallow explanation of the gospel. And I'm from the Republic of Ireland. I'm originally from Cork. The majority of churches I have attended, there have been exceptions, don't get me wrong. There are good churches out there. Do not use this as an excuse to not attend a church. We are called to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 tells us. If there's no good church in your area, you move. People move for jobs. People move for all sorts of reasons. But anyway, but the similar thing was the problem in Calvary Chapel. And it was shallow. They do pride themselves on verse by verse. But, I mean, and it's a problem with evangelicalism as a whole. I didn't want to go away from there and have a huge problem with Calvary Chapel, I thought, oh, well, you know, Chuck Smith, and who I'll talk about in a bit, well, he started the whole thing. And although they do claim it's not a denomination, but it tends to work largely like a denomination or kind of a Baptist union, and I'm not here to debate whether it's a denomination or not a denomination with Calvary Chapel. I'm not here to say that every Calvary Chapel is terrible, uh, but how would I put it? I remember when I, f- when I came across Chuck Smith years ago, I remember he he's well thought of in evangelicalism. I mean, if you look at Dave Hunt's What Love Is This? Now, it's not a very good book by Dave Hunt, but on, on, on the back of it, endorsements by Chuck Smith, and well, Tim LaHaye as well, unfortunately, uh, kind of tells you what the Armenian gospel what kind of <laughs> what kind of support you get from people but i thought okay well chuck smith is an armenian while he is maybe a bit loosey goosey on certain things he's still you know a solid enough bible teacher that's what i thought for a very long time so i was like nah i'm not going to cover that issue Okay, they have their problems, but doesn't every denomination. Then I, you know, over the years, I saw pictures with him with Rick Warren. Not very good company. and uh, But then again, you could picture anybody with Rick Warren. And, you know, just because somebody's in the vicinity of Rick Warren, it doesn't, you know, you could be rebuking him. Probably not, but I suppose you hope for the best and prepare for the worst. So this was not a topic I wanted to cover for a long time. Again... The only exposure I've had to Calvary Chapel was that one Calvary Chapel that I attended for about a couple of months on a Wednesday night, mid mid evening service, and I wasn't I didn't really go away satisfied from it. I didn't really go away. It's the very and it, it, look, it's the same thing with the Baptist Union churches, the same thing with those kind of churches, the same thing with most evangelical churches. Very kind of watered down, weak, unconvincing. You don't know if these people really believe it or if they're going around wondering what everybody else thinks. I I, I don't know if that's the best way to describe it, but I went away almost frustrated with the fact that, you know, I was... And I know there's people who go into churches and oh, I'm on fire for the Lord and they want to do everything. And really what they need to do is learn sound biblical doctrine from the preacher of the word. And maybe the the elders can go to the person's house so they can go to Bible studies and things like that. But it was very weak. And at no time in any of these churches... Calvary Chapel included, Baptist Union churches, other churches, outside of, well, but pri- this is prior to I was in fundamentalist circles for a couple of years, and 
prior to that, I never heard condemnation of Rome. Now, when I started going to an independent fundamental Baptist church, I'm no longer a fundamentalist, by the way. I'm reformed, <laughs> um, most definitely, in case anybody's a little worried. Uh, I've done many videos against dispensationalism, against various facets of uh, fundamentalism. But it, it, it's a hard thing to describe, but I think most people know what I'm talking about. That it's very shallow. And there's times when, you know, you can even listen to Chuck Smith and probably get something out of it. So when I discovered a lot of what I discovered, I was shocked in some ways and then kind of in other ways not shocked. <sighs> and I'm talking about the ecumenism. Now, there's so many issues. I mean, uh, the brother in the Lord who sent me on a lot of this material. I was like, whoa, I did not know that. And I was aware for a long time of what I'm going to talk about today, but this is going to be an ongoing subject of study. I don't plan on just like stopping here and, oh, I'm, I'm finished. No, no, no. Because there's a lot more than meets the eye. I mean, John MacArthur, for example, during his Strange Fire conference, criticized, or at least in the aftermath of the conference when he, gave, when he spoke to uh, the Master Seminary, he criticized the Calvary Chapel movement, talked about its foundations, etc. and so on. And <laughs> many people were not happy. Brian Broderson, who was taken over from Costa Mesa. Is it Costa Mesa? Pop up there. Yeah. I think that's the name of the place. It, it, that is where Chuck Smith was, uh, the pastor. But anyway, that is the main hub. You could say of Calvary Chapel, but he they did not take kindly, and they were trying to be you know re respond with a video called Friendly Fire, and hopefully I respond I'll get back to that at another stage. What I've noticed with the movement as a whole, and I'm talking about with leadership, Chuck Smith, Brian Broderson, who is now taken over from Chuck Smith in a large way. I mean, if if you go onto their website, Calvary Chapel Association, or even calvarychapel.org, which links you to Calvary Chapel Association, there's a number, of, and it's very interesting the way they, they and it, I want to put it this way, I'm not arguing about their denominational framework or non-denominational framework. That's not what I'm trying to look at here. What I'm looking at here is their view towards Roman Catholicism. There's so many things you could discuss, and I will, Lord willing, in other shows, but this is the most serious. And it's not just Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith, who began Calvary Chapel, the kind of the Jesus hippie movement in, was it, late 60s, early 70s. And I knew that he was very ecumenical towards Rome, that he saw... Roman Catholics as brothers and sisters in Christ. I'd seen this quotation years ago, but I thought, okay, maybe it's just isolated to Chuck Smith. Now look at the Calvary Chapel Association website, which says, for almost 40 years, Chuck Smith served the Lord and served the body of Christ around the world. Chuck has passed on the leadership. Apparently, okay, there's not... Now they'll probably claim that just the association... And the association is uh, helps to promote organize, you know groups and activities, but but apparently Chuck passed on the leadership. Okay, is there just one leader? Is it Chuck, Chuck Smith? And well, I think anybody observing from the outside at least sees this, or at least thinks this. For I didn't know for a number of things I've been researching over the last while. It's getting confirmed that there's a heavy connection with all the Calvary chapels. So this is a problem for all the Calvary chapels. Their preachers come out from the Calvary Chapel Bible College. And if this is the ecumenical air that they are breathing, this is a problem for the hall of Calvary Chapel. And one of the reasons why 
many of its ministers often can not have a spine, be toothless. Now, <clears throat> this leadership committee, which took over, or this council, this leadership council, includes two people I'm going to look at today. Brian Broderson, well, I'm going to look at Chuck Smith as well. Brian Broderson, uh, who's pastor of Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, and also David Guzik, who's Calvary Chapel Santa Barbara, who was in, in Germany a number of years ago. Now, there's other people on the... Con- but I want to look at this here because Chuck Smith is clearly very important to the movement. And how one looks at Rome and the Roman Catholic Church, because I, the thing is now, evangelicals are viewing Roman Catholicism as just another denomination. I was wondering, I was really wondering, you know, with Chuck Smith with the quotation, I'll just dig out the quotation here. I got a lot of things in front of me. So bear with me. So So he says, right? This is back in 1993. This is Chuck Smith from his book, Answers for Today, page 157. He states, We should realize that we are all part of the body of Christ and that we aren't any real divisions in the body. We're all one. What a glorious day when we discover that God loves the Baptists and the Presbyterians, and the Methodists, and the Ca- <coughs> <coughs> and the Catholics. We all, we're all his, and we all belong to him. We see the whole body of Christ, and we begin to strive together rather than striving against one another. So it's very ecumenical towards Rome. Chuck also says in the December 1995 issue of Sojourner magazine, which states, Paul points out that some say, I'm of Paul, while others say, I'm of Apollos. He asked, isn't that carnal? But what's the difference between saying that or saying, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Catholic? So he clearly sees... Just before I finish the quotation, he clearly sees Roman Catholicism as another Christian denomination. He goes on to say, I have found that some more spiritual, excuse me, more spiritual person believes the less denominational, denominational he is. We should realize that we're all part of the body of Christ, that there aren't any real divisions in the body. We're all one. And what does this do? This attitude. Again, this is Chuck Smith, the founder of all this. Whatever's gone on, whatever kind of slight craziness, LSD association, we're not going to get into that here, but we might in another show. He sees Roman Catholicism, or at least he saw, as... And he has passed on the leadership. I mean, he's, he's not with us anymore. But this was... What does this kind of attitude do? If your view is, well, uh, you know, some people, they tie strongly to being Presbyterian, Baptist. They're all one. Now, if you want to say reform... Uh, you know, Christians, maybe, going out, handing out tracts, and preaching the gospel. Now, I've heard people saying, oh, it doesn't matter if you're Armenian or Calvinist. No, okay, I can go evangelizing with an Armenian. It depends how much of a consistent Armenian he is. 
If he's an Armenian, unfortunately, he's going to be trying often, not always. I don't want to make you know a blanket statement because I know of several Armenians who don't do this. But if he's a consistent Armenian, or at least a bit more consistent than some, he'll be trying to get people to make a decision. To give their life to Christ or to invite Jesus into their heart. And you might say, what's wrong with that? Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say, invite Jesus into your heart. You do not accept him. He accepts you. So what do you do? Well, you renounce all claim to any ability to save yourself, as in you're spiritually bankrupt. With all the other explanations I just gave you, they are, we can in some way, synergism, cooperate in our salvation. Christ is trying to save you, and now you have to use your will. Now, they don't say this, but your will is not, you're not completely dead in trespass sins, you're just sick. So, there can be problems with somebody who is properly reformed, understands the doctrines of grace, understands the implications in the gospel, etc. and so on. But it can happen, it does happen, I've done it, I'll do it again, and you'll hand out tracts, share the gospel with people, call them to repentance and faith, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone, in Him alone, often because they're, they're not consistent. Praise the Lord, they're not consistent. So, and that's fine. And if and if you want to just say, oh, well, we're going to give, give out tracts in the area with sound biblical literature, and often people will disagree on that as well, why would you want to spread around, say, you know, if you're Char- Charles Finney in a tract, why would you want to share that? You don't. Uh, but if you have a J.C. Royal tract, even though you might agree with him and everything, he was an Anglican, but he did know the gospel. He was sound on the doctrines of grace. Well, everything except for the atonement. No, you know, he's an Amaralian. So, if you're talking like that, fine. There is a kind of a biblical ecumenism where if I see a Baptist, I'm Presbyterian now, if I see a Baptist across the road, I'm not just going to ignore him. Um, Friends of mine are Baptists. Reformed Baptists believe in the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Very close to the Westminster Confession of Faith. But there are differences. We can't just de-emphasize doctrine for the sake of unity. Of course, we can maybe do conferences together and things like that. But we have to be realistic. We have to realize, for example, even just the Presbyterian and the Baptist, there's serious disagreements. We agree on the gospel, but we don't have the same belief in who's in the church. A Presbyterian believes the believers and their children are in the church, the visible church. And that they're in the covenant of grace. And as long as they do not, as long as they're not broken off by unbelief and rebellion against the Lord, they need to be regenerated. They need to be born again just like anybody else, the children of believers. But the visible expression of the church is made up of believers and their children. That's a Presbyterian understanding. And the Baptist will say believers only. That the foundation of baptism is repentance and faith, and therefore, because a child cannot do that, they would say, ergo, then children are not part of the visible church. There's big big implications for that. And while I, I'm still very good friends, most, actually, to be honest, most of my Christian friends are Baptists. Why am I making this point? We cannot de-emphasize doctrine such as this. The sacraments are important. All of the Bible is important. We need to strive to preach the truth and not just try to see how we can accommodate people. Now, we should seek unity. True biblical unity. I've talked about this in other shows. Psalm 133, for example, spells out how pleasant and wonderful it is for the unity of the brethren. But what kind of unity is this? Where people are of the one mind around what the gospel, and it's not just 
oh, well, we all agree in the gospel. We all agree in that. Well, if you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, for example, or the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, or the Savoy Declaration, many of its 30-something chapters, especially, how many chapters again in the 33, 33 chapters, the majority of them, vast majority of them, pr pretty much all of them, deal with the gospel and how someone is saved. The vast majority. So we're not talking about peripheral issues. When a Presbyterian unites around the Westminster Confession, and they should be around the Westminster Confession of Faith, this is a subordinate standard, there is a biblical unity we should strive for. I want to emphasize that. I am not saying pull out from the established church and just let all oh, the churches in ruins, the churches in ruins. I'm never attending church again. You know, Satan clearly has a victory over the church, even though Christ said he will, he will establish his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Yeah, yeah, and I know. Roman Catholics quote that verse all the time, but we need to reclaim it and know what it actually means. The church, by the power of Christ, will be victorious. It's not this beaten up idea that we have in the modern church that has only really been around, it's been really popular since the days of Edward Irving or the Irvingite movement, which is like a pre-Pentecostal Pentecostal movement, the early 1800s. And men like John Nelson Darby with the Dispensationalists and the Plymouth Brethren. This idea, you know, like J Darby was very much, well, the church is in ruins. You can't do anything with it. And so I am not in favor of that. But it has to be biblical unity whether we think and believe the same thing. Unfortunately, with the Calvary Chapel model, it de-emphasizes doctrine and makes only like maybe the Apostles' Creed of importance for unity. And I mean, just so, some of the things they've been quoting, and I know they have talked about on their website, the, you, know, the, you know, they are dispensationalist, talk about the pre-tribulation rapture on their website, and, but they do say, oh, well, this is not essential doctrine. Oh, and I, I'm relieved the dispensationalists will say that the trip, the pre-tribulation rapture, unfortunately, for many people and the churches I was in for a couple of years, made that a kind of a, not for fellowship necessarily, but a kind of a, a benchmark for who they would work with. Separation was the key. And again, it, it all harkens back to John Nelson Darby, that kind of view of the church, and I'm completely against that. But the problem is, if you're rebelling against that idea, or whatever it is, how do we view Roman Catholicism is incredibly important. How about the doctrine of justification by faith alone? How about the doctrine of Original sin. Now they say, oh, well, you know, Roman Catholics believe in original sin. And they do, but it's different to what the Bible teaches. Let's look at some of the differences. Because Chuck Smith saw Roman Catholicism as another Christian denomination from his quotations and from, and, and look, this has not changed. And I'm going to show you this in a minute. It's not just Chuck Smith. It has carried on with Brian Broderson and at least David Gusick. I can't speak for everyone else. But these are part of the leadership committee, and this is a, con this is a contamination. So, on justification, the Council of Trent, which is the, the authoritative council of the Roman Catholic Church during the Counter-Reformation, says in... The sixth session, Canon 12, concerning justification. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, 
which remit sins for Christ's sake, if anyone says that, which is biblical, or that it is confidence alone that justifies us, let him be anathema. If anyone says that the justice the justice received is not is not preserved and is not increased before God through good works. So say if anyone says that justice received is not preserved and is not increased by through good works, you cannot merit through your good works, which are nothing but filthy rags, you know from the scriptures. But that the, those works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained. If anyone says this, what I'm just quoting, and those works are the fruits and signs of justification obtained, because this is against the Reformation. But not the cause of his increase. Basically, the, the cause and increase of grace. You can... You can increase saving grace, justifying grace to yourself through works. This is Roman Catholicism. Through the sacraments. Now, the sacraments are a means of grace, but not a means of saving grace. A person can partake of baptism, but it does not, just like the Word of God. You could say the, the sacraments are the visible Word. And just like the word will only condemn us, as the sacraments will, if not received by faith. From the waters of baptism, we are preaching the gospel that those who are brought into union Christ by, through faith, by repent, uh, repenting of their sins and trusting Christ alone, they're brought into union with Christ, they are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, as surely as they are washed by the waters of baptism, this is the biblical teaching now, that by faith, uh, you know, by believing and trusting him in Christ and upon his atoning work, that and that alone, as surely as that water washes them clean from their filth, so the blood of Christ washes them clean. And the thing is, sacraments to the believer are encouragement are, are there to strengthen faith but they do they're not independent isolated channels of grace irrespective of the faith of the individual now you get into many different issues here but to Roman Catholicism, it is the church that saves. It is the church that excommunicates, not Jesus Christ. I mean, the Roman Catholic Church dug up the bones of John Wycliffe and pronounced him to be excommunicated, to, to be put into the... after he was dead, some years, for translating the Bible. Oh, you say, well, well they've changed now. They're involved in Bible translations. Oh, well, they are, yes, you know, because these new Bible translations are so fantastic. United Bible Society, Ness and Allen, which is virtually copying that. Anyway, well, we won't get into that here because that is another topic for another day. And anathemas against justification. What does it say about baptism? If anyone says that the Roman church, which is the mother and mistresses of all churches, that's what she claims, there is not the true doctrine concerning the sacrament of baptism. So if anybody does not say, says that in the Roman Catholic church, there is not the true doctrine concerning the sacrament of baptism, if you criticize Rome's sacramentalism, let him be anathema. Vatican II did not change that, but reaffirmed it. I don't know if I've got the quotation in front of me here. Yeah, but Vatican II did not repudiate this. It actually really affirmed it. Vatican II was merely window dressing. 
But you might say, okay, well, he sees them. Well, Chuck Smith, how does Chuck, or how did Chuck, sorry, how did Chuck view Roman Catholic? Would he witness to Roman Catholics? Again, this is the founder of this movement. And he has set the pace, you could say, for all that's come. This is from a radio show. On October 11th, 2011, a caller, Ben from Orange, called into Pastor's perspective and asked about him how he can maintain his relationship with those we know is a Calvary and Harvest Fellowship as he's a Catholic and will remain that way. So what does he say? Repent? Believe? that, Or if, you know, if you're... Tr- Look, there may, there may be certain ones have come to Christ, come to faith in Jesus Christ by reading the Word of God in spite of the Roman Catholic Church. There may be some of those, but they may, must be called, come out from among them and be ye separate and I will receive you. Any advice like that? Any, are you trusting Christ or are you trusting in your works? Are, do you believe in the sufficiency of grace to save? And then another one, well, we're going to play this one from October 11th. This is, these are both from 2011. Both of these. I'm going to play two of them. They're both interviews with Catholics. For that. All right. Back we go to the phones to Orange, California, with Ben on the line. Ben, welcome to Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Uh, I am a loyal listener. I uh, love going to uh, your men's conferences, and uh, I fellowship with quite a few people at Calvary Chapels. Uh, uh, and I went to Greg Laurie's Harvest. And I have a question because uh, sometimes I have a hard time understanding um, how I um, communicate with people. Um, of the Protestant faith because I'm Catholic. And mm-hmm. sometimes we um, have communication issues and they want to get into apologetics. And, uh, um, you know, I love the worship and the fellowship with those with different people, but um, I'm going to hang on to my faith as well. And I'm just curious uh, what you think about Okay, good question there, Ben. In fact, we're glad you're going to these events. We're glad you listen to this program. Okay, Chuck, what about that? Ben, I have a cousin who was a mother superior in the Catholic Church and uh, she... So, Mother Superior surely should believe and know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches on transubstantiation that the, in case anybody doesn't know what the, the Roman Church believes about transubstantiation, that the, that the bread and the wine at the altar by the, by the blessing or the consecrating of the priest is made literally the bread or the body and blood of Jesus Christ many were killed prior to reformation etc in different times in history for denying or at least saying and some some of the accounts from the pre-reformation lollards for example you wouldn't know exactly if they were necessarily christians but they denied it that contrary to reason they say, oh, well, the, the bread, it, it's still bread. It's still wine. It has not changed. Transubstantiated has not changed completely because just as the Jesuits, you know, are told, you know, if you're told that which is black is white and white is black, you're supposed to believe it if it comes from the Pope. This is what you're up against here. So does she believe in transubstantiation, which is de- a denial and sufficiency of the death of Jesus Christ? What does Chuck Smith say to someone like that who is a perfect opportunity to share the gospel? What does he say? He was just a wonderful Christian, loved her, and we had great conversations together. She's a mother superior and a what? A wonderful Christian. What? And I didn't try to convert her from Catholicism, nor did she try to convert me uh, into becoming a Catholic. It's just we both recognize that, uh, you know, we have we had the same Lord and the same uh, faith, you know, and so 
Uh, we just the same Lord, the same faith. And uh, another problem too, when the Protestant Church in the last two hundred years abandoned the doctrine of the Antichrist, we covered that show for, for a number of shows in a row that the the man of sin, son of perdition, would come out from among the church, the temple of God, and it did in the seventh century and manifested itself in the man of sin, son of perdition. Because of the abandonment, not just that, but the abandonment of that doctrine, what have you got now? You have evangelicals and Catholics together. And you've the Jesus hippie movement, which just accepts everybody. And no wonder, as I was talking about in the introduction to the show, no wonder there's nothing said about these Roman Catholics in most evangelical churches. Now, I did go to, for a number of years, I went to, up until, hmm, I don't know, what, two, three years ago, I went to fundamentalist churches, and they did preach against Roman Catholicism. Their arguments weren't very good because they weren't getting to the core issue, which was free will and justification and... Honestly, they're, unfortunately, a lot of them would say, well, justification means is just as if I had never sinned, which is not what it means at all. It means to be forensically declared free from sin. This is the problem with watered-down Christianity of today, of anti-creedal Christianity. Oh, it's just me and my Bible. I'm not going to learn anything from anybody else. And we have what we have today. I mean, I would encourage people, get a copy of the Westminster Confession of Faith. Read through what it says in the doctrines of justification. Pray to the Lord and see and test all these things against Scripture. The standard is the Bible. But it can't just be, well, my statement of faith is the Bible or the King James Bible or whatever else. Well, everyone says that. Why do you believe about justification? Why do you believe about election, about the atonement, about the death of Christ, about the perseverance of the saints, what the, the makeup of the church? All these things are important. Uh, you know, on those things that we agreed upon, we just agreed upon, and we didn't really bring up the things where there were disagreements. All right. We're... Mustn't have been a very long conversation. Are you serious? You you knew a mother superior? What what things did you agree on exactly? Well, Chuck's not around anymore to answer these questions, but... <sighs> I mean... The... A man, the Pope of Rome, who claims... To be the head, the universal bishop. Even a title which Gregory the Great said, and I quote that it was the precursor or the forerunner to Antichrist. To take such a title. Then Boniface III took that title in his papacy beginning from 606-607 AD. Let's look at the next call after this. We're going to go to Ontario, California, talk to Beverly. Beverly, you're on Passive's Perspective. Welcome. You have about a minute left, so if you can state your question. Yes, I have a question. Is it right for a Catholic woman to marry a Christian man even though she's pregnant with his child? All right, Pastor Chuck. Well, I don't uh, see that. Uh, well, there's going to be difficulty, uh, you know. is it? Well, well, the question is, well, why on earth did that happen? But, you know, listen to the answer now he gives in a sec. You know, uh, but if you can resolve the differences, I don't think that they're that great. And I think that you probably, uh, if you're pregnant with his child, you should marry him. And, uh, and of course, I think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's all right. It can, uh, uh, you can resolve the differences. I, and I think that, uh, it's, it's, it, I do, I know of many, uh, of that, you know, you know, Catholics are basically Christians too. And, uh, Catholics are basically Christians too. Catholics, Roman Catholics, 
Well, the Christian Jew is just another denomination. So uh, I think that, uh, you know, what the differences are are much less than uh, what a lot of people face and are overcoming in their marriages. I think the more important questions are, is he a good man and do they love each other? Mm -hmm. So fasten your seatbelts. So that is Chuck Smith. I remember, remember I, I said earlier, David Guzik. David Guzik is also on the Leadership Council. What does he think about Roman Catholics? Let's listen to his preaching now on John chapter 10. Going on now to verse 16. Jesus says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them I also must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Okay, in verse 16, Jesus said something very profound. But we need to understand what he means. Notice, go back to verse 16, and he says this. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Do you remember what the fold was? The fold was a structure. It was a sheep pen. The the sheep were enclosed inside of the structure. And Jesus looked at his sheep inside of that fold, inside of that pen, and he goes, okay, these are my sheep, but you know what? My flock is bigger than just this structure. My flock is bigger than just this pen. I have sheep not of this fold. Now, friends, who do you think he was talking about when he said that? Can I tell you who he was talking about? He was talking about you. He was talking about every Gentile believer. He was talking about everybody in a generation beyond that present generation which he spoke He was talking about us. We are the sheep. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're born again by God's Spirit, you are a sheep who is not of the fold that Jesus spoke of immediately. And Jesus was thinking of you even then. Now, before he gets on to his muddled understanding, yes. And what is the fold? The fold is the visible church, which was what? Israel. Um, Just to read from John Gill. He's a Baptist, and commenting on this segment about not of the fold of the Jewish nation and church, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Look at the second half of Ephesians chapter 2. And strangers to the covenants of promise, whereas sheep going astray and were scattered about in the several parts of the world and were to be redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So... Guzik is correct. David Guzik is correct up until this point, but listen where he takes it next. He goes, they are just as much my flock. I am just as much their shepherd, even though they are not within the fold of first century Judaism. They belong to me. Friends, this is a very engaging picture, especially because he says this in verse 16, there will be one flock. Notice this, one flock, many folds. Many structures. If you want to think about it right here, we have a sheep fold right here. Do we not have a structure right here, materially speaking, and a bunch of God's sheep are here together here this morning. This is a sheep fold. But you know what's wonderful? There are many folds. I mean, the application here is woeful, but what's it saying here? The church, the church is the fold, the, uh, as put it, the Jewish nation, uh, not as fold, and that we brought into the covenant. So this is talking about the visible church as a whole. And he even admits that in some way. Now, but that, Israel according to the flesh, Israel as being a, a part of the visible church was removed. Jesus said in Matthew twenty one forty two, and I quote this verse a lot, and I quote these verses a lot, Jesus saith unto them, Do ye never read in the Scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 43, Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of heaven shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. We know from First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that this nation is the church. Now there wasn't, you know, there was a Jewish church, Christian church, it's all one church, 
under different administrations, under different economies, economy, administration, or dispensation. The word, there's nothing wrong with the word dispensation. The word dispensation is, was even used by, and this is not, just because you use the word dispensation does not mean you are dispensationalist. This kind of ridiculous arguing really has to be put to bed, really, with a lot of people who keep making, oh, look, this person mentions dispensation. He's from the early church. Oh, well, he was a dispensationalist. No, different administrations. And there was the one covenant and different economies, administrations, or the word dispensation. And they will admit that it means administration. But it's a kind of a different slant on it, you could say. Now, from but was Israel according to the flesh, or this, this the the council of elders that was there, the Sanhedrin? What did Jesus say to them? Because or why? Because of unbelief. Whoever shall fall in the stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever shall fall, it will grind him to a powder. And if you look at Romans 11, it talks about the, the natural branches, the Jews according to the flesh, those who were within the visible church at that time were broken off, verse 20 of Romans 11, verse 20, and because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, high but fear. Talking to the Gentiles. But this principle carries through that they the, these were churches Israel was a church but soon became what a synagogue of satan they are no longer jews but are of the synagogue of satan revelation chapter 2 verse 9 and also it's in revelation 3 3 can't remember the exact verse but it's referenced twice they became synagogues of satan in the same way the roman catholic church was a church at one point, up until the gospel was still preached, probably at least until about the 6th, 7th century, you can even find various remnants of certain dioceses in northern Italy preaching the gospel in the 9th, 10th century with Ambrose and people like that. There were people within the Roman Catholic community, you know, like the community that preached the gospel, John Wycliffe, and they were killed and excommunicated for doing it. But back then, it's very hard to just, you know, go on the internet and find another church that didn't really happen like that. Now, there was people, there were churches, there were Christians outside of the walls of Rome. But you have to remember the Council of Trent didn't exist by this stage. There's different views. I'm not exactly sure what I believe... But at the very latest point, Rome, the Church of Rome, was cut off from the visible church no later than the Council of Trent, which is probably a, you know, a good explanation. I've talked to various people about this. For you know, for example, with Calvin would recognize Rome's baptism, but this is prior, I believe he wrote this prior, a lot of his views, to the Council of Trent. And then a lot of the reformers after the Council of Trent would be, not everybody, but would have rejected Rome's baptism as being valid baptism because it was not part of the visible church. And, it, you know, because... Uh, anyway, the, what, I need to, what I need to emphasize here is this. The fold was the visible church. The Gentiles were brought in. Now, he is using the application of this in a completely different way. There's different folds. And, you see, if he was going to use this, just say he uses it for a local church setting, David Guzik. And just say he's saying, oh, he's capital. But there's other folds. Well, what you're saying is, if you want to use this verse, well, what you're saying is they're lost and will soon be saved. If you want to use that application straight. But he hasn't. And he's taken a couple of logical leaps where he's jumped over a couple of issues here. You can't use that verse in that way. But how else does he apply this verse? And I think this is really telling. Scattered around our community and our city, 
where many other of God's sheep are meeting together. Now, Jesus, Jesus did not say this. Jesus said, hey, what's really important is bring them together all under one structure. He didn't say that. He said it's okay that there's different folds, but... Again, a misapplication of the verse. He told you exactly what it did mean at the beginning and then went on to apply it in a completely different way. They need to remember that they are always one flock. And friends, this is it. You know, the sheep get together and they kind of decorate their own fold, their own distinctive way. They have it, their own personality, their own their reflections there, what's important to them and how it's at. It's all reflected. But listen, we all understand that even though God... Well, that's wrong. It's a violation of the second commandment. We're not supposed to. Worship is supposed to be according to God's revealed will. We don't approach with our own personality, with, the, with our vain imaginations, with our own idols. Man's brain is an idol-making factory, as John Calvin pointed out correctly has wonderful sheep of other folds, we are all together the same flock. Now, um, some of those other folds feel very different than our own. They might have a different uh, style of music or approach to worship. They, they may be really liturgical. You know, there's very little emphasis on the text here. Uh, they, they, they may have much better preaching. They, they, they may have much different style of service, longer, shorter, whatever it is. But here's the thing. How, with all these diverse structures or folds, how can there be unity among the flock? Friends, it's not complicated. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not complicated. The sheep just need to keep their eye on the shepherd. If the sheep will gather round the shepherd, remember that phrase, to gather round the shepherd, then that's fine. The emphasis isn't on the fold that they're in. The emphasis is on the shepherd himself. Uh, I'll, I'll venture forth with this in a way that I, I, I didn't talk about at first service, but I'll just give this example. Um, I've got some problems in my own mind, in my own thinking, with the sheep fold, so to speak, of, say, for example, the Roman Catholic Church. There are doctrines that they believe in uh, that, that I think uh, are off the mark. There are certain practices that they do that, oh, man, that. And, and, and so when I look at the fold of Roman Catholicism, I go, some, a little off the mark. And Do you know anything about Roman Catholicism? They anathematize the gospel. You either are firmly against them or in complete ignorance of them, which you shouldn't really just comment on them at all. Just anyway, man, I I, I don't want to be in that sheepfold. I'm I'm glad that God has me in my sheepfold. But let me tell you something. When you meet a dear brother or sister who's a Roman Catholic who really loves Jesus, all that just seems to fade away, doesn't it? Somebody really loves Jesus, they will read their Bible, study the scriptures, and realize and see eventually they'll come out. I'm not saying people will instantaneously leave. I mean, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with Richard Bennett, who's been on the show before, he was, uh, he was a Roman Catholic priest just 20, 20 some years, and he, he, he continued to stay after he's. He was saved. He continued to stay there, preach the gospel. And it wasn't until he was kicked out, basically, that... Because they don't want to hear the gospel. Richard Bennett preached the gospel from a Catholic pulpit, and he got in trouble with the bishop where he was. Now, how... See, we're not living in a day where... It's like Luther, and it's 1517, and he's at the beginning of something, and he sees that just shall live by faith alone, re writes his 95 Theses, nails it to the door in Wittenberg. Some of them sound quite Romish still, because he's at the beginning of something, and he doesn't, he hasn't quite you know, reached further understanding, and, and eventually seeing that the Pope of, Pope of Rome was, the, was and is the Antichrist. 
a number of years later. We don't have that excuse anymore. We are surrounded with materials, especially in the Western world. We have internet and everything. Everything's at our fingertips. We don't have this excuse. When people say, you know, when Michael Brown went on Benny Hinn's television show and then puts on Facebook, he didn't know or he's not aware of any of the heresies of Benny Hinn. All he's got to do is look it on the internet and it's very easy. Oh, we can't trust that internet. We'll check the references. It's very easy. We don't have that excuse anymore. We don't, you know, 100 years ago, we could claim ignorance of certain things. You know, we can't access certain materials. We don't have that excuse anymore. What is the visible church? And look, I'm going to read chapter 25 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, paragraph 2. It says, the visible church which is also Catholic and universal, and Catholic just means general. We're talking about Catholic. Every time, see, don't make the Dave Hunt error. Catholic, there's nothing wrong with the word Catholic. The problem is Roman Catholicism. We're talking about, just because the Reformers, and basically everybody up until about 200 years ago, used the word Catholic. The Roman Catholic Church is not the Catholic Church, the true Catholic Church. Catholic Church, the true Catholic Church, or the visible church, are those churches, or it's, you could say the fold, if you want to use David Guzik's terminology, and the well, biblical terminology as well, is the fold in which you have the preaching of the gospel, the administration of the sacraments, and biblical church discipline. If you don't have biblical church discipline, the sacraments are ignored, and the gospel is not preached, it becomes the synagogue of Satan. But it says here, the visible church it consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion. Now, not everybody in there, in uh, the visible church, is part of the invisible church, which is talked about in paragraph 1, and of their children, and is the kingdom of Lord Jesus Christ, and the house and family of God, out of which there is no ordinary possibility of sal. Vation, no ordinary possibility. Because, well, what we mean by that is, if you love God, you will love the brethren. And if I talk to somebody, and I have from time to time talked to people who claim to love the Lord Jesus Christ, who claim to love the church and don't attend, I ser- you have to seriously doubt if that person really knows God. Now, I'm not saying that somebody might go for a while without it, but if you can go for an extremely long time, one of the evidences that you're truly saved is that you're obeying God. You've been regenerated. These good works, as we were quoting there uh, the Council of Trent, are fruits of conversion. The reformers recognized that Rome rejected that and saw it as part of justification. I would recommend for people to... This is a very good edition of it. This is the the Free Church of Scotland. No, it's not the Free Church of Scotland. It is uh, the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Not, to be mistaken... Confused with the Free Presbyterians in Northern Ireland, in Paisley's group, well, was he in Paisley's group? Uh, different group altogether, but they have the same title. Anyway, so, let's continue with David Guzik. Why? Because the emphasis isn't on the fold, we can have a common emphasis on our shepherd. And that's where the unity of the flock really comes through. And so as much as Christians can do it, when they put the emphasis on the shepherd, we understand this broad unity that we have together in the body of Christ. The problem with that is this. Uh, Rome believes that that the Pope, the Pope of Rome, is the vicar of Christ, Vicarius Christi. He's the Pontifex Maximus, the ultimate bridge builder. He is 
as ma- many, many times throughout Roman Catholic Church history, they claimed that he wasn't just the, the victor of Christ, that he was God manifest in the flesh. In 2005, an artist commissioned for the Vatican placed a painting in there, which was called Benedict XVI. You can look this up on Google if you don't believe me. The truth, the way, and the life. What blasphemy. What utter blasphemy. Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. Not Benedict. Not Pope Francis. These sit in the temple of God, professing to be God, among God's people. What utter blasphemy. And they say, oh, well, these things don't matter. Look, I, I know of people who've told me that they were in the Roman Catholic Church, were saved, but eventually they came out. And you tell them in order that they will not dishonor the Lord and Savior of their souls, if they are truly saved, that they will come out and be separate. It's a huge impact. It's going to go to Revelation 17. That this doctrine of the Antichrist, which is seen as being just pure speculation, we can't know. And I, I've done at least three, maybe more shows on the biblical doctrine of Antichrist. You can type it into YouTube or go on the YouTube channel. A lot of the old, all, not all of the old shows, but anything from about show 90 something. And some of the really, really old shows as well are on YouTube. So you don't have to pay for any subscription or anything like that. If people want to contribute, well, they can donate. There's tabs on the website or also at the bottom of the YouTube video if you're watching this, uh, the Megiddo TV version. Now, what does the Lord say? And we should call people to repentance and faith. And what does it mean if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ? You will obey him. If you dis- disobey God, it's a sh- sign of unbelief, which is sin. Revelation 18.4 says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of that ye be oh yeah, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double it according unto her. And we know from Revelation seventeen, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Rome has become a synagogue of Satan. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, And I know thy works and and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. That's spiritual Jews, Jews according to the flesh. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 to 29, Fear not of those which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. But ye be not tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. A sign that somebody's regenerated, they will trust Christ. And if you trust Christ and you obey Christ, you'll come out from that blasphemous organization. To remain in the Roman Catholic Church, outwardly at least, shows one thing. You hate God. You hate God. You might say, oh, I don't hate God if you're a Roman Catholic listening to this. Is it the God of Scripture? Or do you love the God of your own imagination? Because to love the God of your own imagination and then to discover the the biblical God is just, omniscient, omnipresent, all-knowing, will punish every sin. Well, that's not my God. Will cast all those unbelievers, not because of unbelief, but because of their sin, into everlasting fire and 
It is the wrath of Almighty God, is the wrath of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, that is being poured upon them for all eternity. Read Revelation chapter 14. Oh, well, that's not my God, and that's the problem. It is not your God. The God of Roman Catholicism is the Pope, is the Antichrist, who is worshipped, who holds sway over so many people, even outside of the Roman Catholic communion. For God shall send them strong delusion, that they may believe a lie. We see it today. The next thing I want to look at, is it just isolated? Is it just isolated to Chuck Smith, which would be bad enough, because of his influence, and he has not been rebuked or approved by anybody in Calvary Chapel, and he's heavily revered still. He did not waver in this. I believe there's other instances of his view, and he in no way, shape, or form indicated that he didn't believe that Roman Catholics were truly Christians and that they were part of the visible church. David Guzik, the same. How about Brian Broderson? Brian Broderson who took over the, make sure I'm correct here, the Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa and let's see what he believes. And he's been accused of ecumenism. Let's just play this clip and see what he says about it. I'm going to go, going to try and skip through it as much as possible for the sake of time because we're about, how far into the show are we now? We're about an hour and 10 minutes. Here we are this morning, picking up in the fourth chapter. And just for reference sake, this is Brian Broderson preaching on September 7th, 2014, in a message titled, Unity in the Spirit. And the message today is entitled, The Unity of the Spirit. And so as I have pointed out, we've come now to uh, the practical application portion of this letter written by Paul to the Ephesians. And we saw how he begins this, this new section with the uh, call to walk worthy. Walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. I also pointed out uh, that there are two areas that Paul is going to emphasize in this section on our walk. And those two areas are unity and holiness. Those, those are the things that he's going to deal with in this next portion of scripture. Unity and holiness. And these are the two fundamental features of a life worthy of the church's divine calling. And so it's in the first 16 verses that he deals with the subject of, of unity. And then from that point, he goes into the subject of holiness. So over the next few weeks, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 16. Today, we're going to focus on the first six verses, verses 1 through 6. But before we get to that, uh, let me say a few things. Uh, occasionally, I've been asked this question. And the question is... Uh, what do you think the Lord is, is doing today? Or, it, you know, people have asked me, you know, if you, if you had to sort of pinpoint, you know, one area where you really feel like the Spirit is wanting to move or, or the Spirit is, is speaking uh, this, this thing to the church, what, what would that be? What is, what is the Spirit saying to the church today? And I... Uh, generally have replied with, I believe that the Lord is speaking to his church about unity. And this is something that I've been sensing for quite a few years now. As I, as I read the scriptures myself, as I study the word of God, as I travel, as I speak, as I connect with other churches and leaders, I, I just get this sense in these days that this is what the Spirit is saying to the church, that we need to endeavor to maintain the unity of the Spirit. 
And I, I feel strongly about that. I, I feel passionate about that. The Lord is speaking to his church about unity, about loving one another, even across denominational lines. You know, people on the outside, they tend to look at the church and they think because there's so many denominations, Christianity... Now, it's important to emphasize as well, this is uh, Chuck Smith, his uh, Chuck Smith's son-in-law. And trying to get some information here. And that was on a different website anyway, but it's his son-in-law anyway. So he takes over the, he's taken over the same church, Costa Mesa Church. So is he going to be different? Is this going to be a departure? Which can happen sometimes. Is there any indication Calvary Chapel does not, and people say, oh, well, Calvary Chapel is completely independent of each other. And I think functionally, you just see this is not true. They all know each other. I don't know how many, are they all independently trained outside of Calvary Chapel Bible colleges? I don't know. Well, they all seem to be firmly linked together, at least in, a, in an association. There's no indication that there's any renouncing of Chuck Smith's or David Guzik's, or David Guzik's or now Brian Broderson's views. I'm going to play this whole clip. This is going to be another seven minutes, but I think it's really, really important to, to give this because he is one of the most prominent players now after Chuck Smith. After Chuck, Spiss, uh, Chuck Smith's passing. He is just uh, a divided house. And in many ways, quite frankly, they're right, sadly. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. Because as you look at the broader spectrum of Christians all around the world and denominations and so forth, what most of the time people don't realize is that all of us essentially believe the same thing. We just have minor differences, but the sad thing is it's usually... Really? Minor differences? And you say, oh, well, he's not including Roman Catholicism. He is. He is because Chuck Smith did, David Guzik does over the minor differences that we divide and become minor. contentious with one another. So I believe that the Lord is, is wanting unity in his church. He's speaking about loving one another across denominational lines and about working together as members of the universal body of Christ for the advancement of the kingdom of Christ. So that's my conviction, and that's what I have shared with people on occasion. And I have uh, sometimes spoken about this publicly. Uh, sometimes I've written on the subject. Now, not everyone is happy with me about this. Uh, as a matter of fact, this really irritates some people. And uh, I have been accused by some of selling out. I don't know what I've sold out to, but I've been accused of selling out. I've been accused of compromising. Uh, some people have accused me of being emergent. And I know most of you don't even know what that means. And the people that accuse me of that obviously don't know what it means either because they never would accuse me of being emergent if they knew what it oh, really you know, like, meant. Well, because I... Oh, yeah. Well, well I'm definitely an emergent. I'm as far away from emergent as possible. You know, well, <laughs> nobody in the emergent church actually thinks they're emerging. Well, a lot of them anyway. I am the farthest thing from emergent. Some have pejoratively labeled me as an ecumenical. You know what annoys me, too, is when people spend so much time trying to defend themselves. Look, if you're being falsely accused or whatever, just move on. Okay, you might cover a few issues here and there. But if you're not talking about something specific, oh, people have called me this and called me that. Even if you're on the right side of it and you're falsely being accused... The best thing is just to move on. Evangelical. An ecumenical evangelical. Now, I have to say, that is a title that I gladly accept. All of us should be ecumenical evangelicals. What do those words mean? Well, ecumenical, according to Webster's Dictionary, it refers to being involved as Christians with different 
groups of Christians or different kinds of Christian churches. It refers to uh, Christians who seek to relate to the whole body of Christ. I think we are supposed to be ecumenical. We are supposed to look beyond our own uh, congregation. We're supposed to look beyond our own, uh, if it's a denomination or a movement, we're supposed to look beyond that. We're supposed to recognize that the body of Christ is much larger than our own personal experience of it. Evangelical, what does that mean? Well, again, according to Webster's, uh, an evangelical is someone who emphasizes salvation by faith in the atoning death of Jesus Christ through personal conversion. An evangelical is someone who emphasizes the authority of Scripture and the importance of preaching the gospel. So although uh, some who have used this term in reference to me have intended it to be a slight, I, as I said... I gladly accept the title. We should all seek unity among all true Christians. There he gladly accepts it. Therefore, we should be ecumenical. But we can never give up essential biblical truth for the sake of unity. Any separation from Rome, any calling out in the errors of the Church of Rome, which Chuck Smith failed to do, which um, David Guzik fails to do. Actually, oh, well, there's slight differences here and there. Just like William Lane Craig. This is a, this is a cancer across so-called evangelicalism. This watered-down view of what the differences are between an evangelical and a Roman Catholic. Therefore, we must be evangelical. Now, again, let me just define this a bit further. An, an evangelical or evangelicals are, by definition, those who hold fast to essential Orthodox Christian doctrine. That's what an evangelical is. It is a person who holds... Now, he's going to state the essential Christian doctrine... He never mentions justification by faith. He never, this clear dividing lines between Roman Catholicism and the Reformation during the 16th century. And, and it's quite clear because Calvary Chapel is rabidly anti-reformers. Rabidly, now there's times when David Guzik might say some nice things about them and say, oh, well, I've learned some things. But deep down, as Chuck Smith said, it's crisis Christianity. Uh, Brian Brodison said it doesn't have the heart of Christ, things like that. So they're against Calvinism. And you can see that they... It's amazing, these people who often, not always, are fervently against Calvinism or monergism, that it's the work of the Spirit alone to regenerate, not a cooperatistic or cooperate cooperation between the sinner, the dead sinner, oh, he can do anything, being dead is beyond me, and God, that God is trying to save, but only if the sinner, through his will, allows God to save, and that's synergism, that's Roman Catholicism, Arminianism, Molinism, and various other groups around that fringe that believe in free will. Man is free will. He's not completely dead in trespasses and sins. He has some bit of life left in him. He's not dead. He is, you know, because they always give the anal an illustration of if a man is drowning and you throw him something and he lays hold upon it, then that's the gospel. But the problem is with the, ana the Arminian analogies, and the semi-Pelagian analogies of Roman Catholicism and stuff like that is, man is dead. He doesn't even want the solution. So Christ has to come down and give him life and carry him out of the pit, out of, he's drowned, he's dead, he's not drowning. Now, so he goes on and he lists a bunch of things that Roman Catholics could go aha uh -huh to as... Same thing with evangelicals and Catholics together. The resurrection 
and basically stuff that could be summarized in the Apostles' Creed. But there's been more theological controversy since then. For goodness sake, you could get T.D. Jakes, who's a, a, a modalist who denies the Trinity, to affirm the Apostles' Creed. A, we have to realize heretics have clever ways of getting around what you're asking them. But these words, and this is the problem when you just completely isolate yourself from church history and you never look at the previous controversies, that this whole idea, this is me and my Bible. Now, there's no, obviously, everything has to be tested against the light of Scripture. Scripture is the ultimate and final authority. But Scripture advocates and tells us that there are those who which we are to submit to, the elders in the church, they are to teach and aid us. They have been given gifts in order to teach from the pulpit, which is why you cannot claim to be loving God and, uh, and forsaking the assembling of yourselves with the church. Just because there's a lot of apostate churches out there, you find one and you attend. Now, after the show, you're probably like, oh, I'm not going to Calvary Chapel. Don't go to Calvary Chapel. But find a solid Reformed church and move as quickly as possible. Again, people will move for all sorts of reasons, but church is never one of them, unfortunately. Get your priorities right. Get them right right now. This is eternity. You may be saved. You may be a Christian. But are you are you truly putting it all are you putting Christ first? Are you putting his church first? Because if you're not attending church, if you're going cold, you're backslidden. You're backslidden. And the devil would love nothing more than you to not attend church because of all these horrible nasty things and error and confusion. But the thing about it is we are all fallen creatures, and we all have to realize that we need the we need that protection from godly eldership. Now, there's no discernment. There's very little discernment in the Calvary Chapel movement. Very little. However, this is not, and again, I want to emphasize this, this is not a reason to not attend church. Another thing, this is the final thing I'm going to look at. After Pope Francis was, elect, was elected or chosen to be the next Antichrist, the next man of sin, the next son of perdition, um, Brian Broderson put up an article by Louis Pala. I think that's how you pronounce his name. L-U-I-S Pala. P-A-L-A-U. Louis Pala wrote a, an article in Christianity Today, and he, pub, he posted it, saying, interesting perspective on the new pope from Louis Pala. Oh, well, who is Louis Pala? And what does he say? Interesting perspective. And what does he say in this article? In this article, it's Louis Pala, why it matters that Pope Francis drinks Matt Mate with evangelicals, an interview with an, an international evangelist and native Argentine on his friend Jorge Bergoglio. I don't know if I pronounced that properly, but anyway. So, what does he say? What was your reaction when you heard that Bergoglio had been selected as Pope? What does he say? Does he say, well, we reject the Pope of Rome and his claims? To be the head and the universal bishop of the church? I'll be a start. What does he say? It was exciting because of Argentina, because of his personality. Wait a minute. Continuing. And because of his openness toward evangelical Christians. I got kind of emotional simply having known him. Huh. He came in in second to... Pope Benedict XVI in the last election and pulled out of the vote voluntarily because he thought, we shouldn't do this. Vote after vote. I said to him, 
when I saw him afterward, what a pity I thought that I would be able to say, I know the Pope as my friend? I said he'd probably get elected the next time, but he said, no, 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 I'm too old. I'll just skip on. I don't want to read all this because for the sake of time. What can you tell me about Bergoglio's leadership style? He says he's a very Bible-centered man, a very Jesus Christ-centered man. What? The Pope of Rome is a very Bible-centered man. And what does Brian Broderson say about an interesting perspective on the on new Pope from Louis Pola? This is on his Facebook page, dated the, thir- the 15th of March, 2013, right after the election of Pope Francis. An interesting perspective! If this doesn't make your blood boil... And Louis Pala is not... As he doesn't have zero connection, he preached, and this is I got this from Louis Blau's uh, Facebook page. It says, "Please, please pray for Andrew tonight." Uh, oh, so Andrew is probably his son. Anyway, there seems to be a connection. I haven't really found a. I'm just gonna click on this here. I don't know if this is his brother. Anyway. Interesting perspective. It's an interesting perspective to f- to say, oh, I'm excited. He's a Bible-centered man. He lo- Are you kidding me? Do you know how, how far from the pale of biblical historic Christianity you are now? And it says a lot, and it's, you can see, if you've eyes to see and ears to hear, why Calvary Chapel, why they never, never seem to have any spine or any substance. Do they know the scriptures? Do they even have a clue what the differences are between evangelical Christianity or are they just happy to go along to get along? Because church is cookies and coffee and being all nice. I was at a, years ago, this is n- n- not much to do with Calvary. This was not Calvary Chapel now, by the way. It was a Baptist Union, I suppose you could say, get-together. It was... I think there was a number of churches there. And how would I put it? I think, I don't know, was it one or two? Anyway, there was a number of, it was a Baptist Union church, churches. Can't remember the exact time. I think it was around Christmas from about six or seven years. It was the first year I was saved. Went to this kind of a get together party. And there was a, there was a Mormon there. Were they witnessing him to him and exposing that Mormonism was a dangerous cult? No. Actually, and I was saved a few months, and I was distraught, and I was so angry, and it was a number of times this has happened, and shame on me for remaining silent. Actually, shame on me as well. But it's surrounded by, there was elders there, there were people who were in the church many years. And I think, yeah, I think there was like two, one or two, at least two Mormons there. And, and, and there was opportunities. There were, and I didn't at the time know it, a, a ton about Mormonism. I know a lot more about it now. But what do we do? What did they do? I only found, actually, I only found, he was talking about Jesus and things like that. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just think he was a Christian. Was he approached? Or, no. I only found it at the very end. I was like, Church of Latter-day Saints, isn't that Mormonism? But 
again, I was very young in the faith. I hadn't really much of a clue. I was saved a few months. Was anybody going to him making him feel at least a little bit uncomfortable calling him to repent? No. And I had the same experience when there'd be Roman Catholics around. They're made to feel, and this happens in loads of places, they're made to feel like they're Christians. This is the environment, and it's poisonous, that engulfs and surrounds most evangelical churches. And again, I say this, do not use this as an excuse not to go to church. A church. If there's not a good one in your area, move. I pray this has been a blessing to some people. And I pray if some people in Calvary Chapel are watching this, whether it be their pastors or people who attend, can you work for a reformation within and pull away from the Calvary Chapel Association, if, if possible? Find another group. Now, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you're in the one Calvary Chapel where he's preaching the word of God but you're still in an association which endorses, which calls Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church, another Christian denomination. You've heard it from Chuck Smith and from two, probably more, two of the leadership council, David Guzik and Brian Broderson. This, we don't even, we're not even getting into the part about them being part of the charismatic movement. We're not even getting into that. We're not even getting into what John MacArthur was talking about uh, during his Strange Fire conference. <laughs> and there's loads more. But the most important thing is the gospel. Do they have the gospel right? Calvary Chapel is incredibly ecumenical. I'm Paul Flynn. Talk to you again next week.